Welcome to the first in my series of animal care videos. So today's video is about how to care for chickens, whether you're starting a chicken farm or you just want to raise a backyard flock. If you're just wanting to learn something specific, you can skip ahead to any of the timestamps listed here. So first I want to give a very brief introduction to owning chickens. So today around most of the world, our society is industrialized and modern. These days, you can just go to the grocery store anytime you need meat or eggs. So why do so many people around the world still raise their own chickens? So everyone has their own unique reason for why they raise chickens, or why they want to raise chickens. But most people agree that raising your own chickens is often more humane, more sustainable, more fulfilling, and more enriching than going to the grocery store and buying eggs or meat which are often coming from factory farms. Raising chickens is a great way to connect with your family or teach your children responsibility. Not to mention if you're raising chickens for eggs, they can make great pets. If you're not sure whether chickens are right for you and your family, keep watching this video and we're going to go over the ins and outs of taking care of chickens so you can see exactly what it's like to raise these wonderful animals. So let's talk about the different breeds of chickens, and what they're used for. There are so many different breeds of chickens, it would be pretty difficult to list all of them here in this one video. However, I'm going to list some of the most common breeds that I see. Different breeds of chickens fall under different categories, some of which include meat chickens, egg producing chickens, and exotic designer breeds. Some of the most common egg laying breeds include leghorns, Americana, Rhode Island Reds, Plymouth Rocks, Orpingtons, Australorps, Delawares, Sussex, Wyandotte, and Sulkies. It's important to note that different breeds produce a different number of eggs. Some chickens lay more, some chickens lay less. Some chickens lay eggs for longer in their lives, whereas others stop producing eggs sooner. It's a good idea to do some research on which breed you think is best for you. If you're looking to raise chickens to produce your own meat, here are some of the breeds that I notice are most commonly used for that purpose. Cornish, Plymouth Rock, Rhode Island Reds, New Hampshire's, Brahma's, Black Jersey Giants, Buff Orpingtons, Delaware's, Black Australorps, and Sussex. Note that any chicken you buy that is labeled as a broiler chicken is designed to be raised for meat. Many of the breeds that I listed here come in different colors and varieties. If you're looking to raise chickens for both meat and eggs, several of the breeds I listed are great dual purpose chickens. While you're looking into and trying to decide which breeds of chickens are best for you and your family, you can find some pretty great resources out there on each breed, their temperament, hardiness, how much they produce in terms of meat or eggs, so on and so forth. Different breeds have different traits, and they each have their own pros and cons. Now let's talk about feeding and watering. Chickens are naturally omnivores, which means their diet consists of both plants and animals. Unless you plan on pasture raising your chickens 100% of the time, your chickens should be fed every day. There are plenty of different brands of commercial chicken food available at local feed stores. Different varieties of commercial chicken feed serve different purposes. For instance, some feeds are specifically designed for raising meat chickens, whereas other feeds are specifically designed for egg laying hens. Likewise, some feeds are just for chicks. If you don't want to raise your chickens off of commercial feed, 
You can also feed them a fresh diet with things like table scraps, crickets, and mealworms. Or you can even mix all of these things together to give your chickens a good variety in their feed. If you're giving your chickens table scraps, just make sure what you're giving them is okay for chickens and not toxic. If you do plan on pasture raising your chickens, it's a good idea to take a look at where you're going to be running your chickens. How much land do you have? And how much of that land is going to be used for your chickens? What kind of plant life do you have on this land? Are there going to be enough bugs, grass, forages, etc. for the number of chickens you have? These are great things to take into consideration when you plan on pasture raising chickens. It's also a good idea to rotate your chickens to different areas of land every now and then. Pasture raising chickens is a very holistic method of feeding your chickens and raising your chickens. It can be very beneficial for both the chickens and the land they're grazing on. However, this is not a method that entirely takes care of itself. Remember to check on all of your chickens every day to make sure none of them are losing any weight and check on the area where they're grazing and make sure that that land isn't being overgrazed, just as you would with any other livestock animal on pasture. There is no one-size-fits-all for feeding chickens. Something that works for someone else and their birds might not work for you and your birds. Just like the process of choosing a breed, deciding what to feed your chickens should be done through some consideration of what would be best for you and your birds. Now, regardless of whether you want to feed your birds off of pasture, off of commercial feed, or off of fresh foods, there are some things that all chickens will need. No matter what kind of chickens you're raising or for what purpose, all chickens need grit in their diet. Grit should be provided every day, free choice. Grit can be purchased through commercial sources or there are some recipes to make it yourself. Grit that is intended for chickens is essential to their diet. Without grit, a chicken could suffer from impaction or sadly even pass away. If you're raising your chickens on pasture, you might be lucky enough to have natural grit in your pasture soil. This is great to have. However, it's still recommended to supply your chickens with free choice scratch in a trough or a bowl or somewhere easily accessible to them, just in case they don't consume enough grit from the natural soil. If your chickens are laying eggs, they must have a source of calcium in their diet. This could be from crushed eggshells or even oyster cells that you can purchase commercially. Needless to say, all chickens need a fresh source of water at all times. Their water should be clean and free of any bacteria, algae, or parasites. If you live in very hot climates, you might need to add electrolytes to your chicken's water in the summer. Likewise, if you live in an extremely cold climate, you might need to add a heater to your water to keep it from freezing over in the winter. As a side note, if you're hoping to raise organic meat or eggs, your chickens must be fed organic feed. Now let's talk about housing your chickens. When it comes to housing, first and foremost, you should always check with your city and make sure that you're actually allowed to have the chickens you want to raise in your backyard. If you live outside of city limits in the country, this shouldn't be necessary. If you want to raise chickens in your backyard and you do live in the city, after you make sure it's legal to have these chickens, it's still a good idea to go to your neighbors and see how they feel about it. Some neighbors don't like hearing roosters crow in the middle of the night, and some neighbors just won't like the smell and just general sounds that chickens tend to produce, which could lead some neighbors to filing complaints. If you have some neighbors that are a little hesitant about the idea of you having chickens next door to them, maybe you can strike a deal with them and offer them fresh eggs. Once those formalities are out of the way and you're ready to bring home your chickens, it's time to decide what kind of housing you're going to use for your chickens. There are plenty of different styles of coops and runs available. You can choose to either buy a ready-made coop or build one yourself. Some chicken runs, known as chicken tractors, actually have wheels or some other sled type system to where you can move them across the ground, thus making it easier on you and your chickens to access different grazing spots. I just want to take a moment to say 
Even if you are pasture raising your chickens, your chickens must have some kind of a shelter to go into at night and to protect them from predators. It is important to take note that your chicken's coop or other shelter needs to be big enough for the number of chickens you have. And I personally recommend getting a coop a little bit bigger than you think you might need because from what I've seen with other chicken raisers and what I've experienced personally, next year when you see more baby chicks at Tractor Supply, you're probably going to want some more. As a general rule of thumb, you should have 4 square feet of coop space per chicken and 8 square feet of run space per chicken. Although there are many different shapes, sizes, styles, and colors, so on and so forth, of chicken coops and runs, there are some things that all chicken coops should have. Your chicken coop should be durable and weatherproof. I'm sure you don't want it falling apart the first time it rains. Your chicken coop should also have adequate protection from the elements. This includes protecting your chickens from strong winds, rain, cold, the sun, snow, or any other hazardous weather. Your chickens should always be nice and dry and cozy to maintain their optimal health. Your chicken coop should also have some kind of bedding that's easy to clean, stays dry, and is dust free. It's a bonus if your bedding is absorbent, thus minimizing any odors. As a general rule, always stay away from cedar bedding for chickens. Cedar bedding is known to cause a lot of respiratory issues. Paper bedding, shavings excluding cedar shavings, and straw are popular options for chicken coop bedding. There are also pelletized bedding that are specifically made for chicken coops. Your chicken's housing should always have fresh food and water bowls or feeders available at all times. Your chicken's feeding and water stations, whether it's their chicken food, their oyster shells, or their grit, should all be dry. You can always use something like a dog bowl for their food or water, but there are specific chicken-made feeders that you can buy online or in stores. If you are using a dog bowl for water, just make sure that it's not deep enough for them to drown in. Although it's not absolutely necessary, ideally, your chicken coop should have some perches for your chickens to sleep on. If you live in an extremely hot climate, you might want to consider adding a fan to your chicken coop. And if you live somewhere very cold, you might consider adding a heater in the winter. Please also keep in mind that your chickens shouldn't stay in a small coop every day. They should be allowed to roam or have some kind of access to exercise every day. Chickens need space. If you can't provide your chickens with time outside of their coop, you might want to consider getting them a rather large coop or run to make up for the lack of exercise that they would be getting if they were roaming. Additionally, if you're raising chickens for eggs or if you plan to hatch your own meat chickens, you need nest boxes for your chickens to lay eggs in. There are plenty of nest boxes that you can buy in stores or you can watch a quick DIY video on how to build your own nest boxes. There will be a link in the description below linking you to another one of my videos where I teach you how to make your own nest boxes for relatively cheap. The number of nest boxes you need depends on the number of hens you have. The standard is one nest box every two to three hens. However, I notice some hens are okay with sharing a nest box and therefore in some cases you can get by with having less nest boxes. There will be a section in this video later on where I talk about predators. But for housing, you should always make sure that your chicken cooper run is predator proof to protect your birds. Now let's talk about raising chicks. You can choose to hatch your own chicks using an incubator or a broody hen, or you can buy chicks that have already been born from select feed stores or hatcheries. A broody hen is a hen that chooses and decides to hatch her chicks. A broody hen is invaluable if you're trying to hatch chicks out of your own flock, or even ordering eggs that are fertile online. I will be posting an entire video just about broody hens in a future video. 
I've always found that broody hens have an extremely high success rate with hatching chicks. However, not everyone has access to a broody hen, and not everyone can get their hens to go broody. In that case, you're going to need an incubator to hatch your eggs. Incubators can be bought in store or online, and there are actually some videos out there that can show you how to build your own incubator. Before trying to hatch any eggs, you first need to make sure that they're fertile. The process to do this is called candling. To candle your eggs, you can use a small flashlight from a hardware store, or you can buy a specially made flashlight meant for candling chicken eggs. Some incubators on the market actually come with their own candling system. In a freshly hatched egg, it might be a little difficult to tell if your egg is fertile or not. But after a couple days, when you candle the egg, if it's fertile, it should have a little dark spot, and that is a baby chicken. The further along the egg is in development, the easier it is to see the chicken inside the egg. Here's a useful chart to show you the development of the chicken inside the egg when you are candling it. Chickens take an average of 20 to 21 days to incubate. Temperature is incredibly important for hatching chicken eggs. Too cold and your eggs will not survive. Too hot and the same will happen. Your eggs will not make it. 100 degrees Fahrenheit is the optimum temperature for hatching chicken eggs. Humidity is also extremely important for chicken eggs. If it's not humid enough, your eggs could shrink wrap and the baby chickens within them could pass away. However, if it's too humid, your eggs might develop mold or bacteria and not make it. Ideally, on day one through day 17 of incubation, your humidity should be between 50 and 55%. However, on day 18 through day 21, you should increase your humidity to 70%. Most commercial incubators make it easy to control temperature and humidity. It's important to read the instruction manual to your incubator before using it on your eggs. In regards to broody hens, broody hens are very good at controlling the humidity and the temperature of the eggs they're sitting on. This is all part of their innate mother's instinct. However, sometimes broody hens have trouble regulating the temperature and the humidity of every single egg they're sitting on, especially if they're sitting on quite a few eggs. It might be good to add a humidity gauge and an outdoor thermometer to your broody hen's nest so you can keep a closer eye on things. Once your chicks are all completely hatched, you can lower the temperature to 95 degrees. Once hatching begins, the baby chicks will create a small hole in the egg known as peeping. Once your chicks start peeping from their eggs, it's important to leave them alone. If you try to help them out of the egg, you might cause them to pass away unintentionally. The blood vessels inside the egg that are attached to the chicken still haven't dried up yet in this process. Once the first peep is made, most chicks hatch within five to seven hours, but some chicks can take up to 24 hours to completely exit their shell. Once the chicks are completely dried off after exiting their shell, you can move them into the broodery. After they've all hatched, the broodery is where your chicks will stay until they're old enough to be moved outside. If it's at least over 50 degrees Fahrenheit outside, your chicks should be ready to go outside as soon as six weeks old. If it's pretty cold outside, below 50 degrees Fahrenheit, you might want to keep your chickens in for a bit longer. You can make a cheap and easy broodery out of a large Tupperware bin, or you can buy a bin specially for chicks from your local feed store. Just make sure if you're using a plastic bin that it can't melt under the heat lamp. Speaking of heat lamps, chicks need a heat lamp or some other form of heat to keep them warm until they're six weeks old and ready to move outside. There are different kinds of heat lamps available in stores for different purposes. But for your chicks, you should always use a heat lamp that is designed for baby chickens. A reptile lamp may not be suffice, or a workshop lamp may be too hot. At first, your broodery should be at 95 degrees Fahrenheit. After the chicks are one week old, 
you can gradually start decreasing the temperature by 5 degrees each week until you hit around 55 degrees Fahrenheit or 60 degrees Fahrenheit. If your chicks are too cold or too hot, they may not survive. If you're using a broody hen to hatch eggs, you can also let her raise the chicks. Mothers are usually very good at this, so long as you provide them with the right enclosure. Regardless, you should be feeding your chicks a medicated starter feed meant for baby chicks. Needless to say, it's important to always provide fresh water to your baby chicks. It's highly recommended that you use a specialized chicken waterer to do this. If your chicks jump in the water and get wet, they could either drown or catch cold and pass away. The bedding you use for your baby chicks, just like your adult chickens, should be dust free and you should avoid cedar. It is also important to note that the placement of the heat lamp should not be too high from the brooder, but not too close to the ground. If the heat lamp is too close to the bedding, it might fry the baby chicks or start a fire. Once your chicks are in the broodery, you can handle them every day to make them more docile as they grow up. However, don't keep them away from the heat lamp for too long. All chickens can be pretty messy. However, I notice chicks tend to be more messy than adults. Therefore, it's important to keep your broodery clean. Replace the bedding as needed, or you can use a deep litter method, which is covering the old bedding with new bedding and layering up from there. Whichever method works best for you. I should note that I'm not reading off of a script, so earlier when I was talking about housing, I forgot to mention cleaning a chicken's bedding. Chicken coop bedding should be cleaned every three to four weeks or depending on as needed. Chickens can poop a lot and it can get smelly. So it's a good idea for the health of your chickens and for your own sanity to clean their coop regularly. Disposing of dirty bedding for a large chicken coop can be pretty difficult if you don't have a manure disposal system, such as a compost or someone who comes and picks up your chicken manure and old bedding for free to use on their own gardens. However, if you're lacking these two options, you can always dispose of your old chicken bedding much like you would lawn clippings or when you rake up leaves. Never cleaning your chicken coop or not cleaning it regularly enough can cause a lot of issues such as parasites, respiratory infections, or diseases of the feet and skin. Not to mention it attracts flies which lay maggots, which are not fun to have around, especially not in the chicken coop. While chickens sometimes eat maggots, it's really not good for them because sometimes flies and maggots do carry diseases of their own. Not to mention, an excessively dirty coop is also hazardous for you and your family to walk into. Chicken manure that is allowed to sit for long periods creates a toxic dust that could make you very sick. So it's a good idea to keep your coop clean as much as you need, or every three to four weeks. Now that that's out of the way, let's talk about predators. Predators can be a huge threat to your birds, and there are many people who lose chickens to predators. It's a very common issue. The best way to deal with predators is to prevent predators. This is true for all animals that you keep. The best action is prevention. Your safest bet is to make sure that your enclosures are predator proof before putting your birds in your coops or runs. That way, if something about your predator proofing isn't quite working right, you have time to fix it and prepare it before the birds are introduced to the coop. It's a good idea to do some research on what kinds of predators you have in your area that often prey on chickens. Do you live in the city and your biggest concern is raccoons or maybe coyotes? Or do you live in the country in the mountains and your biggest concern are bigger animals like bears or mountain lions? Depending on what kind of predators you have to worry about in your area, is what determines what kind of predator proofing you need to make in your own coop. A lot of predators will try to tear through chicken wire and most of them can rip through chicken wire. So it's a good idea to double layer your chicken wire with something stronger like galvanized steel. 
Some predators like to dig under coops if they can't break through the fencing. That might be another problem for you. In this case, I recommend digging under the perimeter of your coop and laying down some kind of barrier under the perimeter, such as cement or maybe a foot or two of extra fencing underneath the ground. Now, some predators, if they can't break through the fencing and they can't dig under, they will try to climb the fencing to get over, such as raccoons are pretty big on this. In that case, your chicken coop or your run needs to have a strong and sturdy roof. Not only will it keep out climbing predators, such as possums, raccoons, so on and so forth, it will keep out hawks. Hawks are major threats to chickens. Having a sturdy, durable netting on top of your coop or fencing on top can keep these predators away from your precious birds. Another predator that a lot of people don't talk about, or should I say predators, are cats and dogs, especially if you live in the suburbs and you're trying to raise backyard chickens. Loose cats and dogs pose a very serious threat to livestock animals. Dog and cat lovers out there might find it shocking to hear that dogs and cats are responsible for a lot of chicken-related deaths. Especially when these animals are untrained and left to roam around neighborhoods. Just like wild predators, dogs and cats have a hunting instinct. So even if you don't have to worry about big predators in your area, and you live in the city, it, it might be wise to consider predator-proofing with dogs that are loose in mind. Now, if you have the means to do so, you might also consider getting a dog of your own to protect your chickens. Now, this dog would be a livestock guardian dog. However, do make sure that your livestock guardian dog is trained around chickens. Plenty of times, livestock guardian dogs don't really know how to behave around chickens. Uh, they're, they're more bred for protecting goats or sheep or cattle. So you have to teach your livestock guardian dog that chickens are to be protected, not killed. There are plenty of deterrents you can install to keep predators away from your animals. You can install motion-activated lights, sound systems, so on and so forth. Dealing with predators when you have livestock animals really is a topic in and of itself. I do plan on posting a longer video just about predators and livestock at a later date. Now I know this is a long video, but the knowledge is worth it. Next let's talk about some common illnesses that your chickens can suffer from, or even your baby chicks. Now this is not an all-inclusive list. This is simply some of the most common illnesses that chickens, whether it be backyard chickens or farm-bred chickens, suffer from. Now, I'd just like to point out, I am not a veterinarian in no way, and I have not been trained by any veterinarians. This is simply a list of some of the most common issues that backyard flocks or farm-raised chickens suffer from. I cannot give any treatment advice, nor can I post any remedies for all of these illnesses. However, in a future video, I do plan on making something in regards to natural remedies for minor injuries or illnesses that chickens may suffer from. However, if you think your chickens are very ill or if they're injured, you should always consult with a veterinarian instead of YouTube. Although money may, may be tight, you have to kind of decide for yourself, would you like to pay the vet bill to make your chicken better or risk losing your bird. Now, to save time, I'm also not going to be discussing all of the individual symptoms for each of these diseases. I think that might end up being a 30 minute video in and of itself. However, the most common illnesses that I noticed that you should be aware of and you should be on the lookout for include coccidiosis. Yes, I had to look that one up to see how to pronounce it. <laughs> Merrick's disease, Newcastle disease, avian influenza, bronchitis, pneumonia, smallpox, salmonella, foul cholera, and chicken respiratory disease. Some of these illnesses are actually transferable to people. And likewise, if you're sick, you could also potentially get your chickens sick. 
These are simply 10 of the most common illnesses that I've seen other people having with their birds, and in general on Google searches, the most common issues that chickens suffer from, whether it be viral, bacterial, or through poor hygiene. It's important to note that chickens can suffer from a variety of illnesses. As I said, they can be viral in nature or bacterial, fungal, or they can even be caused by injuries, such as an infected wound or even myasis. Sometimes we get sick and we can't help it. Sometimes our animals get sick and we can't help it. However, the best steps to take are preventative measures of making sure your birds have enough space, making sure that their spaces are clean and tidy, making sure that their food is not spoiled or moldy or anything like that, and making sure they have very clean water. Limiting your bird's contact with other animals can also prevent illnesses. However, if you're dealing with a sick chicken, or if your chicken gets sick in the future, it's important to not beat yourself up over it. Chickens are very sensitive animals, and sometimes these things happen. Raising chickens is very rewarding, but it's not easy. And especially when you're first starting out, you're bound to have some mishaps. However, don't let this dishearten you or discourage you. The best thing you can do if you have a chicken that gets hurt or sick, or if you just in general have some kind of a bump in the road with raising chickens, the best thing you can do is to identify your mistake, learn from it, and do better in the future. Don't give up. I promise it will be worth it if you do not give up. Raising chickens can be pretty stressful, especially if you're new at it. But a few years down the line, things will get a lot easier, you will get more informed, and eventually you'll be able to identify some of these issues that come with chickens on the spot. It is totally, totally normal to be stressed out from your birds. All that means is that you love and care about your chickens, and that's great. Now, if your chicken is going through some kind of an illness or maybe some kind of an infection that you're not sure what it is, but you don't really have the money to take it to a vet just to find out that it's fine. Although I recommend taking them to a vet, I know some people are not really in that position financially. There are plenty of chicken forums on the internet you can join or Facebook groups where you can talk with other chicken owners that are probably a little more experienced than you and get their advice and their opinion on what your bird is going through at the moment. And even if this video didn't tell you everything you wanted to know or didn't answer all of your questions on raising chickens, those forums are great for those purposes as well. I'm so excited that you guys are watching my videos. It, it really makes me happy to see new people really getting into chickens. And it's great to see that we can expand and build our community like this. Now on the topic of community, let's get into our last topic on this video, which is all about the chicken community. Whether you're new to chickens or you've had chickens for a while, getting involved with your community about chickens or really anything you're passionate about can be really great for your mental health and it can be very fulfilling and enriching in life. You can meet new friends, talk with people who are more experienced with you, or even teach others what they don't know that you might know about chickens. There are a plethora of different websites and forums that you can join, like Facebook, Discord, or the like, that you can join to talk with other people who love chickens just as much as you do. If you're looking to build friendship and community in the chicken world that's not online, you can join 4-H or FFA and actually take your chickens to shows. You can meet friends, you can learn, 4-H and FFA are really great resources to get involved in the chicken community. Especially if you're young, you could grow up with so many skills just from these two groups. Not to mention that 4-H and FFA help to build your future. They offer scholarships for college, they offer career building paths, they are just very great groups to get engaged with. As somebody who grew up in the FFA, I can't recommend either 4-H or FFA enough. Whether you're young and you're thinking about joining or whether you're an adult and you have kids and you're thinking about enrolling one of your kids in 4-H or FFA. 
Now, if you're an adult and you don't have any kids, or maybe your kids are already in FFA, or you don't want them in FFA, and you're looking for a physical in-person community that you can join yourself, there are still options for you. 4-H and FFA are mostly designed for people who are underage. However, if you're an adult looking for a community that you can engage with, there are options for you. And I'd still like to point out that even as an adult, you can volunteer at 4-H and FFA to help them set up events. And even if you have certain certifications, educate people on animals and how to care for animals. It's also very important for future generations that as adults, we keep animal husbandry and homesteading alive for future generations in our fast-paced technological society. Now, if you're an adult looking for community and friendship within the community of fellow chicken lovers, it's great to look up and see in your area if there are any chicken clubs that cater to adults. Or if you have purebred chickens, why not take them to chicken shows? While you may not have championship blood chickens, it's still a fun experience to go. And if you don't have any chicken clubs in your area, or chicken shows, or chicken events in general in your area, why not start one? I'm sure there are other people in your area who are enthusiastic about chickens just like you are, who would like to see events and clubs like that. Now I know this video was really long, but I hope you guys enjoyed it, and I hope you learned a lot, and I really hope I helped you along on your chicken raising journey. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you made it this far, you guys are amazing. Thank you so much. If you'd like to, you can leave a like, a comment, or you can subscribe. It helps me out a ton. I'm trying to build my YouTube channel for my animals and for myself, and it just helps us out a lot on the farm. Thank you guys. See you next time.